Well, hey, thanks for joining us for Worship Online here at Desert Springs. And as always, you can share your prayer requests with us. Just reach out using our contact information here at the bottom of the main page at visitdsc.org. And I want to say thank you, too, for your faithful support in giving. Just click that blue Give button here on our main page. Finally, God bless you as you follow the Lord, and now let's join worship as it's already begun. It makes me white as snow, no other fount I know, nothing but the blood of Jesus. If you're watching online uh, during this service, you can uh, pause and get some bread or a cracker and some juice or a little wine, and you can celebrate communion with us if you've accepted the Lord in your life and you're seeking to live for Him. And I'd invite us all to bow and let's pray together. Heavenly Father, how thankful we are for the gift of life that you offer us in the dear gift of your Son, Jesus. Lord, all of your word from Genesis to Revelation speaks of a Messiah who would come and a Messiah who came and a Messiah who's coming again. And we know his name and his name is Jesus, the only Son of God, the Lamb of God, who took away the sin of the world. And so, Lord, as we've come to you and believed, received you into our life by faith and now seek to follow you, we thank you for your loving forgiveness. And we celebrate together, Lord, the great price you paid for us in being our sacrifice in this time of communion. And we, we turn our attention to you, and we thank you, and we praise you today. In Jesus' name, amen. If you take your cup, please, and you can turn it with the juice side down, you can peel off your top cracker label. You don't even have to peel it all the way off and pour your cracker out. Scripture tells us on the night that Jesus was betrayed, he took bread, he broke it, and he said, this is my body given for you. Whenever you eat it, think upon me. Let's think upon our Lord and the price he paid. If you turn your cup over, you can peel back your label for your juice. After dinner, Jesus took the cup and he said, this is my blood poured out for the remission of sins. Whenever you drink it, think upon me. For my pardon, this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus. For my cleansing, this my plea, nothing but the blood of Jesus. Oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus oh precious is the flow that white as snow no other fount I know nothing but the blood of Jesus nothing but the blood of Jesus 
Amen. Amen. Thank you, A.B., so much, and thanks to the whole worship team. We're glad you're with us. And um, you know you're committed to the Lord when you come out during the month of August. We're glad you're here. And a lot getting ready to, to kick off again. You can see in your program, we're getting ready for September. Uh, Men's and Women's Ministries. I'm holding in my hand a fall devotional book for September, October, November. You can pick up your copies uh, in the lobby right after service or a connecting place counter. And uh, a half of a half of a page, I love to say, of just uh, taking some time each day with the Lord, uh, reading some scripture, applying it to your life, and then having a time of prayer and um, uh, worship with the Lord. It's a great way to spend every day and um, a great way to get centered again on the Lord. I, to me, that's what I love about communion, is communion as we've celebrated just a moment ago. Uh, it's a time to, to refocus again on our, on our loving Lord and, and what life is all about and the new life we have because of Him. And uh, we kind of need that, don't we? Sometimes just get refocused again. It's easy to get uh, underneath the problems and the stresses and the challenges and, and uh, even the errands of life. And um, uh, uh, our topic for today's message is going to be all about that in a few minutes. So don't, please don't go anywhere. Uh, but before that, we're going to go ahead and receive offering. And so I'd like to invite hosts, if you'd please come forward. Would you bow with me? We'll pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love for us. A love that planned and delivered exactly what we needed, your own dear son. And Lord Jesus, that you would come and pay the price of our sin. We're so grateful. And Holy Spirit, that you would empower us and, and live with us and, and work with us through life to live new lives for you. We're, we're just so thankful today, God. And uh, Lord, we live in a world of need, a world of problem, a world of dilemma, a world of hurt. And so how we thank you for how you're working, how we invite you to work in every life situation that we face and in the lives of those we love. And God, we'll be careful to give you the credit, to praise your name and to let others know that you're the one who puts the hope in our hearts and the joy in our spirits. Today, Lord, we offer to you a portion of what you give to us in our tithes and offerings. We pray you'd bless it and use it for your glory here in the church, in all of our ministries, in the missionaries and outreach partners we support, and in the lives of people, that they would come to know you and grow in you. And it's in your name, Lord God, we pray. Amen. Welcome to Desert Springs Church. We're so glad you've joined us. If this is your first day at Desert Springs Church, please stop by our Connecting Place counter. We have a gift for you and want to thank you for coming. The Legacy Class is hosting an ice cream and bingo social for our senior adults. Mark your calendar for Sunday, August 11th at 4 p.m. in the family room at Desert Springs. There's no fee to attend, however, a $5 donation is appreciated. Also, if you'd like to volunteer, contribute ice cream, toppings, or treats, or just find out more information, please reach out to event organizer Sharon Orr. Ignite Student Ministry bookends its summer with a trip to Knott's Berry Farm. Both high school students and middle school students are welcome to attend, but must register with Pastor Colin by Sunday, August 11th for their tickets. Middle school students do have a free ticket and a half ticket for middle school friends in lieu of not going to camp. High school can register with Pastor Colin for a reduced rate ticket of $40. That's all day rides and fun for $40. The trip is coming up quick, August 15th. We leave DSC at 8 a.m. and return to the church by 10 p.m. Finally, remember, August 11th is the last day students can register for their free or reduced ticket. Please contact Pastor Colin for more information. Thank you for loving Desert Springs Church through your tithes and offerings. We really appreciate your generous support. If you'd like to know more about Desert Springs Church or to give online, please go to www.visitdsc.org for everything else that's happening. All right. Well, it, it's great to know that uh, youth are going to Knott's Berry Farm this week. Uh, I don't know about you, my favorite ride at Knott's Berry Farm, it's the chicken dinner. <laughs> yeah. I mean, really. It's fantastic. And uh, you don't even have to pay admission to the park. But anyway, that's another story. All right. Um, so um, uh, uh, thank you uh, for uh, uh, bearing with me last week as we were out of town. Sherry and I were with... Um, uh, extended family up in um, uh, kind of central northern California at Twin Lakes, uh, which is uh, just very close, 12 miles from Yosemite. Uh, they're really um, spending time with family and, and sharing the gospel. 
And uh, we felt your prayers. For those of you who prayed, thank you, really, from the bottom of our hearts. And uh, we, we were able, we had, an, we had openings, we had God's favor, and we were able to share. And while we, we didn't see anyone in the family at that moment commit their life to Christ, we felt that uh, wonderful gospel seeds were planted in every single one of the family's lives that were there. And there were 13 of us, and, and um, uh, you know, uh, we, we made the point to them, none of us are getting any younger. And uh, as, as a, a cousin my age uh, just died of a stroke suddenly, and another cousin who was even younger died of a separate stroke two weeks later. Uh, it was a great time. Sometimes death reminds people of wanting life. And uh, so it was a wonderful time, and I thank you so much. We really felt more than ever before a favor that this was the time, this was the moment. And, and I just, it's not my message, but I just want to say, you know, at the tail end of my book on, on um, Just Be You, A Witness for Christ, and, and, and I wrote an additional chapter. I want to thank Jean Denning, who's in the service. She's sitting by Len uh, there and by Corey. And um, uh, she, she was so kind in my revision version to add in my chapter 10. And, and if you've gotten the book and you don't have chapter 10, just go to Connecting Place and we'll give you the manuscript version of that extra chapter. It's on witnessing to your family. And I just don't know a better way to witness to family than to pray, 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 and then be genuine. Uh, because your family knows who you really are anyway. And uh, what, a, what a great thing to, um, to just pray. And we prayed for so many years, and so we continue to pray. But we believe that God's really making um, a strong influence now uh, in each of their lives. And, and so I had wanted to preach last week uh, on the topic of patience from James 1, verses 2 to 4. And I just couldn't shake it. So thank you for putting up with my video message. And uh, you're all very kind. And I promise not to do that on a regular basis. Uh, but, um, uh, but it helped me uh, get into the topic because I want to spend two more weeks in James 1, verses 2 to 4. Uh, I, I think it's such a, a pivotal statement in Scripture, uh, the idea that, that we should find uh, a sense of fulfillment, a sense of thankfulness, a sense of gratitude, a sense of anticipation uh, regarding uh, times of challenge and suffering in our lives as believers. Humanly speaking, it makes absolutely no sense. But over these three weeks together, I think we'll be reminded that when we know the Lord, God loves us so much, anything he allows in our lives that is difficult and painful is for a greater good. And uh, as we have committed our lives to him, so he uses us as his servants, so he rounds us as his followers. And um, uh, even in, in the hardest of times, God is in control. So we're going to talk about that again today in our second week. I've never preached the same text three weeks in a row, and that's what we're going to do. Today's topic is growing uh, strong in trying times, growing strong in trying times. And this is part one of two weeks together. Uh, now, uh, I don't know whether you're facing uh, hard or trying times right now in your life. Perhaps you know, if not personally, someone in your life who is. It could be that you've just come out of a trying time and, and your head is still a little spinning from it. You're wondering perhaps why. Or it could be that you've had an extended time of, of suffering and hardship and affliction in your life. It could be that you're in a season of, of uh, peace and uh, refreshment in the Lord. And uh, God bless you if that's the case. Uh, it could be you're just in an ordinary time. And, uh, and you say, well, you know, I, I don't know, I'm doing okay. Uh, but I, I'd remind you, the topic is for all of us. And uh, it's something then we can share with others. Uh, and uh, we'll get into the reason for that in a moment. But by way of background, if we were to, in the book of James, if you flip over there in your paper Bible, or if you have an app on your phone or tablet, you can uh, pop your app on to uh, James 1. If we went forward to verses 22 to 25, we read, prove yourselves doers of the word, and not merely hearers who delude themselves. Now, I love that word delude there. 
It, it's saying there that it's possible to be a believer in Jesus who week by week by week by week throughout their life simply, utterly, and entirely fools themselves thinking that just hearing God's word matters at all. Because this text tells us it doesn't. It's not until we take the word of God and begin confidently and faithfully to apply it to our own lives that the power of God kicks in and life transformation truly comes into effect. So prove yourselves doers of the word and not merely hearers who delude themselves. It says we don't delude God, we don't fool anyone else, we're only fooling ourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man who looks at his natural face in a mirror. For once he has looked at himself and gone away, he has immediately forgotten what kind of person he was. But one who looks intently at the perfect law, the law of liberty, and abides by it, not having become a forgetful hearer, but an effectual doer, this man shall be blessed in what he does. Now this is one of the strongest statements I believe in all of the Bible for uh, sort of getting on the stick with God's word and actively engaging and applying it. Uh, receive his word, believer. Open up to it and uh, wrestle with it and swallow it and digest it in your life as a follower of Christ uh, so that you can benefit from its nutrients that will make you strong and new in Him. And uh, this is so important when we come into this topic of growing strong in trying times that I, I feel even before we can get back to our text today in verses two to four here in James chapter one, uh, we need to do a little background on the topic. You know, whenever we're in challenging times, uh, I think what we long for the most is good news, relief, a sense of uh, a release of the pressure, if you will. And uh, I, I don't know, but in those times of frustration, those times of fearfulness, those times of anger, those times of resentment, even those times of doubt and worry, uh, whatever we face, uh, the Bible says we can know God is with us. God is with us. I often think of Romans chapter 8 where it says, if God is for us, who can be against us? And when I've read that verse, even from the time I was a child, I've always thought, then my job is to make sure I'm on God's side. Because if God is for us, who can be against us? As long as I'm with God, then he's for me. And uh, what a great thing to know that if we're seeking to sort of row the boat in life, God's direction, then we know we're for God and we know that God is with us. And if he is with us, who can be against us? So remember that from Romans chapter eight, don't go through life alone. Invite the Lord into every life situation, into your times of need, into your times of hardship, into your times of ordinary living. And then understand that in trying times, God wants us to glean the very best within those tough situations. And uh, God will even use the tough stuff of life to develop us in our character, in our faith, in our love for him and uh, uh, others. Now, uh, enter Jesus who came into our fallen world to preach good news. And uh, boy, if we ever needed some lasting hope, it was the hope of the gospel, that we could be forgiven of our sins and assured of heaven. And that's what Jesus came to do. Jesus said, I didn't come to judge the world, but that the world might be saved through me. And so uh, the Lord is the one who came to offer true peace and, and lasting hope and, and a promising future. And the Bible says he's the only one who can deliver it in our lives on time and on schedule. And uh, what a great thing to know that in Luke chapter four, we find the fulfillment of Isaiah 61's great prophecy. When Jesus in his hometown of Nazareth went into the synagogue on the Sabbath, opened the scrolls and began to read from Isaiah 61, the spirit of the Lord is upon me 
because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free those who are downtrodden, to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. So this is why Jesus came. If anyone ever asks you, you know, well, well, what's the significance of Jesus and why, why do you uh, go to church and what's it all about? It's because I worship Jesus Christ, God's son, who came to rescue us. He has declared it. And uh, remember that uh, after he read that portion of the scroll in Luke chapter four, he declared that it was fulfilled. The prophecy was fulfilled that day in their hearing. He came to be the fulfillment of our need of a savior. So if the Lord came to be our savior, why all the hardship in our personal lives today? And the obvious question is, is his eternal plan not working? Did he have a system failure and the hard drive just won't reboot? Is God too weak to deliver on his promise of salvation? Is it all just heavenly hype to encourage us as human beings within a world that is a hopeless situation? Well, no, God is our salvation in Christ. And central to our understanding of God and his one and only son, Jesus, is addressing this ultimate life question. And I think it's the biggest question unbelievers raise it's the biggest challenge I think young believers in Christ struggle with. And that is the question that if God is real, and he is, and if he really sent his only son into our world to rescue us, which he did, why hardship? Why hardship? And, uh, you know, uh, there have been books written, and, and, and uh, one of them, uh, perhaps the most well-known, uh, Why Do Bad Things Happen to Good People? Uh, I recommend, there's a wonderful, uh, very uh, uh, fast read book by Ann Graham Lotz, daughter of Billy Graham, and it's simply called Why. And uh, it, it's, a, it's a wonderful text on the subject of our message this morning. Why hardship? Why could a loving God, as the Bible describes our God, uh, in fact, in 1 John it says God is love. How could he allow difficulty in our world when he says he loves and cares about us so much? Why would he allow his own son to come into an imperfect planet and wind up being crucified on a cross? And the pieces at a surface level, at a superficial vantage point, just don't add up and make sense. Well, the Bible tells us when we give it a good read, that God is not to blame for the trying times in our fallen world life experience. We find in the same book of Isaiah, uh, the one Jesus read from here in his hometown, the answer to the reason for our hardship. In Isaiah 53 verse six we read, all of us like sheep have gone astray, each of us has turned to his own way. But the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Him, Jesus Christ, his only son. So when we come to faith in Christ, God promises to help us and to rescue us, to go with us through life. Psalm 91, one says, he who dwells in the shelter of the Most High will abide in the shadow of the Almighty. Uh, yet even our passage, and we're about to read it here in just a moment, confirms that even when we're saved by believing in Jesus, yet there are troubles in this world we will inevitably face, even as children of the living God. Now, some trying times will require that we bow the knee before the Lord and accept that he alone has divine authority over us. In Psalm 103, we read, the Lord has established his throne in the heavens and his sovereignty rules over all. So this verse reminds us that 
As much as I want to take control of my life, I don't have control of it. God does. As much as uh, uh, people in political office would say they're in control, God says they're not. The Bible says God lifts up one and abases another. He's the one who puts kings and rulers into their positions of authority. He determines the epochs and the seasons. So God is the one in all authority. His sovereignty rules over it all. In Philippians chapter 2, we read, God highly exalted Christ and gave him the name which is above every name, that at the name of Jesus, uh, every knee would bow and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, within God's divine authority and within the fallen nature of our world due to the effects of our sin, as we read a moment ago from Isaiah chapter 53, we know that there are times in life that are truly very hard. And those are the times when we must simply submit ourselves to a loving creator, the one who is in charge. And we must simply entrust ourselves to him, call out to him, and wait upon him. Now that brings us to the bedrock of our message this morning. Uh, the whole point, I believe, of James chapter 1, verses 2 to 4. Uh, for those seasons of life, those times of great difficulty, uh, the moments that make us wonder, hey, where did God go? I'm having a really hard time here. That's when James chapter 1, verses 2, 3, and 4 truly set in. And I'm reading this morning from the New Living Translation. Dear brothers and sisters, when troubles of any kind come your way, consider it an opportunity for great joy. For you know that when your faith is tested, your endurance has a chance to grow. So let it grow. For when your endurance is fully developed, you will be perfect and complete, needing nothing. Now, this is not an easy section of, of Scripture to accept or apply because it, 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 it's hard, but it's true. It's God's word for our lives. Last week, we looked at the topic of the patience that God can develop in our lives through hard times when we surrender to Him. Today, we look at the important theology, the belief of why we can hold that we have a loving God and yet we can experience hardship on this life experience. I believe this morning that God's word reveals at least four sources for trying times within our lives. And when we looked at the text just a moment ago in verses two, three, and four of James chapter one, uh, we, we say that when troubles come your way, not if, but when. And so the natural question is, well, why are they coming? Why are they coming? And, and I would submit to you for your, your prayerful study, consideration, and approval, fellow follower of the Lord, that uh, we can wrongly uh, make a false conclusion on this topic. There are those believers who would say, well, if you just live an obedient life to Jesus, it's going to be smooth sailing. That's not true. I've known very committed followers of Christ who faced very hard things. There have been those who said, well, you know, as long as you love Jesus and you honor him and you give money and you serve and you do all these things, that somehow you'll never be sick You'll never have a financial lack. You'll never have difficulty in your relationship. And, and I don't believe that because the text doesn't put qualifications on it. It says when, believer, when troubles come your way. And so I'd like to offer four areas for why I believe scripturally that we can experience hard times in our lives, even when we come to faith in Christ, even when we're seeking to live for him. And uh, your note sheet has room for these four reasons. First, we can experience hardship due to ourselves. This is the most obvious. But don't worry, there are three other reasons. We can experience hardship due to ourselves. I've had this happen to me. How about you? 
Uh, Galatians 6, uh, verse 7, don't be deceived. God is not mocked. Whatever a man sows, this he shall also reap. The Bible says when we choose to disobey God's laws, go against him in life, there will be repercussions. Now, I, I don't know about you growing up, but in, in my family, there were repercussions. And uh, uh, there were certain boundary markers, and, and if I didn't obey those, there would be repercussions. God in his word warns us because he loves us. As a loving parent, a loving heavenly father, he created us, he sustains us, and he says, kids, if you get out of the boundaries, there will be consequences. Why? Because he loves us. We live in a rebellious world that says there should be no rules. It's not true. Without rules, we will have mass anarchy and destruction. So there have to be boundaries in life. And the Bible says here that at times we suffer because we've gone against God's laws and commands. So we can't really fairly blame God for our own faults, our own mistakes, and our own blatant sins, our own addictions, our own uh, compromises. Uh, sin is not God's fault. So uh, if we're going through a time of affliction and, and we're able to say, you know what? I don't have to think too hard about this one. It's my own fault. Uh, how about when David uh, went into adultery with Bathsheba and sinned against the Lord and then murdered her husband, Uriah the Hittite? That was his fault. And he went through great affliction and suffered the loss of his own son because of that great sin. That qualifies under number one this morning. And uh, uh, what is the, the best response when we go against God and then the outcome of the sin starts impacting our life? And by the way, remember that our sin not only affects us, it affects others around us. And so we need to be mindful of that. Of course, the best thing to do is, is go back to God and confess our sin. That's what David did. And you can read about his confession in Psalm chapter 51. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence, and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of thy salvation, and sustain me with a willing spirit. Then I will teach sinners your ways, and they will be converted to thee. So the correct response to going against God is to come back and confess our sin. And the Bible says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, we can go back to the one who's in charge of our lives and uh, say, Lord, forgive me. Lord, help me. So don't get down. Don't get depressed. Go to God. Be honest and then pursue his will and his ways for your life because God's way works. And there have been times in my life when I've gone against God, sinned against him, and the Lord will then lay on my heart as I confess it before him. And I, I, I tell him, Lord, I was wrong. Please forgive me, help me. I want to turn from it. I want to live faithfully for you. Sometimes the Lord will lay on my heart. Now you need to go apologize. Now you need to go seek to make amends. It, it, can't, it can't make up for the sin. But sometimes God wants us to take good steps of righteous behavior to alleviate some of the suffering we've caused others. So uh, then we, we move forward on a fresh footing, back in the Lord's direction. So that sometimes suffering in our life is as simple as that. Secondly, we can experience hardship due to living for Christ. I thought it'd be kind of fun to do these first two together because it shows the great contrast. You can live against God and suffer the repercussions. In a sinful world against Jesus Christ, you can suffer for living for him. I think this is why the greatest temptation of many Western believers is to try to half it, to be somewhere in between. Know Jesus so you go to heaven, but don't get too extreme like loving Jesus with all your heart 
because then you might suffer for doing the right thing. And I'd say, look, I'd rather suffer for doing what's right than doing what's wrong. How about you? And the Lord made clear in the book of Revelation that those who are lukewarm in their faith, God will spit them out of his mouth. God wants us to be yes or no for him. So the healthy life in Jesus Christ is always the all out life for Jesus Christ. And I would remind us today, if you're gonna have a hardship in life, have a hardship for doing what's right for the Lord. Because God sees us suffer for his ways and his righteousness, and he will reward us for it. He will reward us for it. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.12, indeed, all, how many? All who desire to live godly in Christ Jesus will suffer persecution or will be persecuted. So if, if you are living for the Lord and you don't get that promotion at work, if you're living for the Lord and your neighbor snubs you, if you're living for the Lord and, and you're having trouble in a relationship, keep living for the Lord. And uh, the Bible says to praise God that, that you've been counted worthy to suffer for doing what's right. Believe me, the Lord won't forget one thing you suffer for his name. You'll be rewarded for it, believer. Jesus said in Matthew chapter five, when we're persecuted for following him, rejoice, we're in good company, God will reward us. So you can, you can see it's true what I'm telling you, Matthew five verses 11 and 12 describe it. Now, persecution can come from others in our world, it can come from just society in general. And it can also come from spiritual forces working in the, the supernatural realm. Because there's not only a God and angels, there's a devil and there are demons. And we're in spiritual warfare. So at times, uh, when you're following the Lord, when you're doing a great work for him, you'll sense the resistance. You know, I would say if, if you're an obedient believer, if you're seeking the honor of the Lord and you're not experiencing some spiritual resistance, something's wrong in your life because we should be experiencing it on a regular basis. We, we should have these, these doubtful thoughts and say, no, that's not from the Lord. I'm not going to believe that. We should have those things, those threats coming at us. We know I'm going to trust God. He's my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? And so spiritual tension should be a normal part of the obedient believer's life as they pursue Jesus Christ and honoring him and doing his work. Thirdly, we can experience hardship due to correction. And now comes godly discipline, godly discipline. Proverbs 3.12 says, for the Lord corrects those he loves. You know, one of the ways I, I know that I grew up in a loving home, my parents corrected me. If they just said, hey, do whatever you want, we're busy, we're working. I would have really doubted that they even cared. And uh, our kids need correction. Now they need loving correction. They need appropriate correction, correction that doesn't break them. And uh, fathers are not to exasperate their children, the Bible says but we are to correct them in love because that's what our heavenly father does for those he loves, Proverbs 3.12. And then it's repeated again in Hebrews chapter 12, verse six, for those whom the Lord loves, he disciplines. So Old Testament and New Testament alike, God has not changed his mind. One of the ways we may uh, experience hardship in our life is God is working to correct us. Maybe he's having us experience something to improve something in our character that he's working on. Maybe he wants to show us what happens if we keep going down the line we're presently traveling on. So God corrects. God has the ability to get our absolute undivided attention. The Bible says he loves us so much, he won't leave us alone. And that's a good thing. Because the Bible tells us a loving parent disciplines. Not to tear us down, but to correctly 
build us up. So, believer, if you sense that maybe you're in a hard time because God may be working in your life to correct you, my advice is receive what he's trying to correct. And uh, so we can take these points this morning and we say, Lord, based on what I'm going through right now or the person I love is going through, do I think that's because they, they uh, are reaping what they sowed in life? Is it because they're honoring you in their life and it's persecution? Or could it be this third thing that maybe, God, you're working to correct something in their life? Correct the is there any of us who don't need some correction from the Lord? I just praise the Lord. He doesn't correct us every second of our lives. He's so loving. He, he gives us room to breathe. He gives us time. But if it's an area that he's working on, and we, we can see that, we can say, Lord, if you're trying to correct something in my life, help me to see what it is and help me to submit to your way regarding that topic in my life. It's the best way to see that time of testing, that time of trial, uh, wrap up more quickly as we can apply it. Fourthly, and we're done this morning, we can experience hardship uh, due to others and the world. We can experience hardship in our lives due to others and the world. In Luke chapter 13, we read that Jesus said, do you suppose that those 18 on whom the tower in Siloam fell and killed them were worse culprits than all the men who live in Jerusalem? I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. What Jesus was saying here is that uh, the, the, uh, the uh, world is not operating as God intended it. Even the, the horrible catastrophes, even the natural disasters, the horrible events of life are the effects of a sinful world because we have chosen to go against God and we live under the curse of sin. That is until we come to faith in Christ and we have our Savior. So things are not as they were created to be on this planet. And that's the ingredient the unbeliever doesn't understand when they ask the question, how could a loving God uh, allow these bad things? The answer is the curse of sin. And it can be because of our own sinfulness against God, we're sowing what we, or we're reaping what we sowed. It could be, again, uh, for a believer who's following Christ, that they're suffering in the name of Christ for doing what's right. And then, of course, uh, it could be uh, that, um, uh, uh, you know, uh, we're, we're in this case um, experiencing the damaging effects of a fallen sinful world. And uh, God can redeem those hard times in life. Perhaps um, you, you uh, had a great hardship growing up because your parents divorced, you felt abandoned, you felt alone. Maybe you were mistreated. Maybe you were, you were horribly hurt. Uh, there are all kinds of horrible things in life, and we don't get to choose what we must go through in a fallen world. But the Lord is there to love us, to provide healing and comfort, and uh, He's the one we need to go to. And uh, I want you to know the Lord's with you, believer, in the middle of anything that you're facing. And... Um, uh, Jesus was with his disciples in the rocking boat when it was about to sink. He didn't walk away. He could have just walked away right on the stormy water and left him out there bobbing, but he didn't. He was simply quiet in the boat, waiting for them to come to the end of themselves when they would finally turn to him and ask for his help. And so, believer, I would say, especially when you're suffering due to the effects of a fallen world, turn to the Lord in those situations. And rather than blame him, ask for his rescue, ask for his comfort, and know this, that in this area, as well as all of these areas of suffering and hardship in our lives, God wants to use it for his glory to remake us, to conform us more and more to the image of Jesus Christ. God will not allow one thing to go wasted in the life of the submitted believer. And so in, even in the most trying of times, our Lord is still in control and he loves you and the Lord is near. Jesus said, I'll never leave you nor forsake you. And so you can count on that. 
And as we believe that he is with us, and as we believe that he is deeply concerned for us, we can loosen our grip on the pain and the dilemma that confronts us. And we can keep our grip on the one who makes life worthwhile. So in the tough times, in, in every time of life, hold fast to him. And that's our final thought this morning. Hold fast to him. Brings us to our takeout verse. It's in a little card in the lobby as we conclude today. Hebrews 10, 23. Let us hold fast the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. The biggest thing that's tested in times of adversity is our trust in God, our faith in him. And that is the thing I believe more than anything else God wants to stretch and develop and grow in every one of our lives. A greater confidence, a greater assurance, a greater belief that God loves us, he's with us, he's all powerful, he will handle the things which concern us. So no matter what you're going through, know this believer, God won't let go of you, so don't let go of him. Would you bow with me? We'll pray. Heavenly Father, today we thank you for your great love. We thank you for the seasons of refreshment in our lives. And Lord, how we pray and commit to you our need of you, especially in our times of need. Lord, forgive us when we doubt you, when we complain to you, when we try to self-govern these hard times, rather than simply coming to you and seeking your will and your way in our hard seasons of life. Thank you for the grace you can pour over us. Thank you for the peace you can give us even when we suffer. Thank you for the joy you can put back in our spirits even in the hard times. And thank you, Lord, that you are more than able to accomplish everything that concerns us. So, Lord, we bow and we worship you. We submit to your will and your ways alone. And we thank you that, Lord, you are in control. We actively put our trust in you. And we come to you today and we pray your will be done. Thank you, Lord. And if you're listening now and you don't know you've ever invited Jesus to come into your life, to give your life to him. Jesus said, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish, but have everlasting life. Jesus came as our sacrifice for sin. The Bible calls him the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so if you believe that Jesus is God's son, that he died for your sins on the cross, he was buried, and three days later he rose from the dead to declare that the price of sin has been paid, that you can be forgiven and assured of heaven. And he invites you today to come to him, to be willing to turn from your sins, to receive him into your life, and give your life to him. And he'll come in, he'll forgive you of everything, help you to live for him, and he'll forgive you when you don't. It's a free gift, but you must believe on Jesus for it. And so if you're ready to do that, you can just talk to the Lord right now in prayer and you can settle it. And you can start your life with him. Just pray and say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me. I believe you're God's only son, that you died for my sins on the cross and rose from the dead so I can live with you forever in heaven. Please forgive me of everything and come in my life right now. I'm willing to turn from my old ways to live for you. And it's in Jesus' name I pray and thank you. Amen. Amen. God bless you. Thanks for joining us today. Will you stand? We'll close with a blessing. Uh, if you'd like prayer in your life today, maybe for someone you love, someone who's going through a hard time, uh, please come forward at the end of service. And here come the members of our prayer team. We've got Patty, Sharon, 
uh, Hal coming forward. We'd love to pray with you. Uh, just come forward at the end of service and hang around, meet somebody new. If you're going to the class, you've got 11 minutes. And uh, they have an ice cream social today too, right? Peak four o'clock. So it's a great day for, for the legacy class. Now may God bless you, may he keep you, may God make his face shine on you. May God be generous to you, give you his peace. May God ease your pain. May God deliver his protection. May God bless you, watch over you, and grant you victory in whatever he allows. Amen.